Um, today we're actually going to talk about a very exciting topic. I'm, I'm quite happy about the lecture today. Uh, probe it. It's um, actually the first time we'll be dealing with simulation. So up until now we've been dealing with models that have closed forms and uh, were actually known 20 years ago. Um, they're extremely important background, but this is when we really start what's the modern discrete choice analysis. Uh, but before getting into that, I want to go over the problem set a little bit um, and just make sure everything turned out fine. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because, like I said, I'm kind of hyped up for this pro it discussion. Uh, first of all, the answers to all the problem sets, including now this one, are on the website. So, uh, I'm sorry, on the class account. So uh, you can get all the programs. Y'all had requested that. There should be a manual hard copy, a uh, hard copy of the manual in the computer lab now, is there? Has anyone seen it? Gauss? Is there? Good. It will stay there until somebody decides to steal it. So the longer y'all uh, avoid that temptation, the longer it'll be around. We really can't do this because it's uh, making one copy. I made it as my personal copy, and that's legal. But you can't make multiple copies without, you know, buying them from Gauss, essentially. You could put a sensor on the, on the copy. That's an idea. On each individual page, in fact. <laughs> um, it is, I know. You know, Grace has a manual also that you can go and just look at it in your office. Isn't it available as a PDF file? It is. The problem is it's really hard looking through those PDF files, and that's what the concern was. Yeah. Um, and also, there is now a probit um, problem set on the uh, class account, but don't do it this week. Uh, we're going to spend this week and next week talking about probit, and you won't understand the program until we finish the lecture next week. So this week, there's no problem sets. Hey. Okay, so you ran this, and the first issue was um, you got a log sum coefficient of 0.59, um, not negative 0.59. I don't know how that typo got into the, an, into the thing. Um, and so that tells you that there's a fairly moderate correlation around you know, 0.4. It's, it's not uh, trivial. And you can test whether it's a log sum coefficient of 1, which is essentially testing the probit model. Who did that? How'd you do it? Uh, I just ran a sample logic and did the likelihood test. Right. And I couldn't judge the hypothesis. Right. You could not? No. Huh, that's interesting. Um, that's one way to do the test. An alternative test, which is asymptotically equivalent, is to do a t-test. Um, so you, then you don't have to run a model. And there you do reject. With the likelihood ratio you do as well. You do reject with the likelihood yeah. ratio? I think the thing is that it gives you the like, mean likelihood and you have to multiply it by the number of observations. Mm. Yeah. Good. Well, that's nice that you get the same result doing it the two ways. I got a t-statistic of 2.5 which means you can reject the hypothesis that the logit model is correct. Um, we then re-estimate with the room alternatives in one nest and the central alternatives in another nest. So that didn't really take rewriting the program, just rearranging what's up on the top part. You get a log sum coefficient of 1.36, right? Um, that's not inconceivable. As we had described before, it means that substitution out of the nest is more likely than substitution within the nest. There's a higher substitution out of the nest than within. Um, and it is consistent with utility maximization within a range of the data. Okay? So it's not inconceivable, but it is a little bizarre. It's not what you'd really expect in these situations with nested logits. Um, if you test the hypothesis that's equal to 1, what happens? You reject? Yeah, you can't. I accepted. Yeah, you cannot reject. I got a T statistic of, yeah, about 0.64 or something like that. Also, what's interesting here is if you're trying to, I think you were asking last week about how do you decide which nests are right. Um, all the evidence seems to point to the earlier model being better. This one has a worse log likelihood also. 
So it's got the same number of parameters, same number of nests, and yet it fits worse. It's got this su kind of surprising value for the log uh, sum coefficient, and you can't reject logit on this one, whereas the other one you could reject logit. So all that combined would make you think that the first model is probably better. Um, so this is, you know, that, this is essentially the way you do this testing until you move to a model that's more general than both of these and test them as against that more general one, which requires simulation. Um, and then, what did we do next? Oh, you estimated a separate log sum coefficient for each nest. Which nest got the larger log sum coefficient? Cooling? Right. That's what I got. I got 0.6 for cooling and 0.45 for non-cooling, right? And so the cooling alternatives have a smaller variance in their utility, and the non-cooling have a higher correlation, variance in their common term. Um, does that make sense? I mean, it's really hard to tell here. I, I, I could, you could tell stories on either side. But you do want to think about it every time you do get these to see whether it seems to make sense. If you test the hypothesis that they're equal, what happens? You cannot reject the hypothesis that they're the same. And so this seems to be a generalization that doesn't buy you much. It doesn't give you a lot of extra intuition of what's going on. And it also is not significantly different from the first model we did. Quick question. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have problems getting number three to converge. And it seems like those that were successful programmed it slightly differently, even though if you looked at it, it should do the same thing. I don't know if you... I have had that problem also. Um, this is endemic to models that have uh, poorly shaped likelihood functions, and that often how you parameterize and where the, uh, and even issues like where errors accumulate in the calculations affect what you do. So often, sometimes, I think in fact on these, when I wrote mine, I wrote one and it didn't converge, and so I re-parameterized it and rewrote it in a different way that was equivalent. Uh, so I guess that's confirming what you were finding. This happens a lot. It happens in probit all the time. Um, and this is one reason I'm very excited about the stuff we're going to talk about very last part of the semester on hierarchical bays. Essentially, there are de we're developing now estimation procedures that don't require maximization. Um, and all these problems that inevitably arise uh, can be avoided. But short of using those estimators, you just got to tweak and reparameterize until you get something that converges. And then, let's see. Oh, you tried three nests. So you put the gas central in a, in a nest of its own. Estimated. Um, your log sum coefficient was not significantly different from zero in this case. So it kind of removed the significance that you had before. And also, you get a worse log likelihood. So this model seems worse. I yes, the two te you can test either way. Um, I usually do that one, testing the two parameters to be e equal through a likelihood ratio test, because if you try to do a t test, you got to get the variance of each and the covariance between the two parameters to get into the denominator. So I use a t-statistic where you're testing one parameter against a fixed value, because then all you need is the variance of that one parameter. Um, and then I use likelihood ratio test for everything else. But the two are equivalent. Well, asymptotically equivalent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the value for the log sum coefficients in question number four? In the last one, I got a 0.84. Is that what you got? 9.5. What'd you get? You got 9.5? Did anyone get 0.84? Well, I must have done something different from all of you. Well, my, my answers on the, um, 
answer problem set answers. So you can go in and see how I wrote it roast versus how you wrote it. Um, rewrite the code. Turn to four. Well, I don't remember. I'll go back and check that, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, one of us did it wrong. Must have been me. Majority opinion here. <laughs> okay. Done with, yeah. No, the pseudo R square is what I defined earlier as the uh, likelihood um, uh, index ratio, I think I called it. It's the one minus one minus log likelihood at convergence divided by log likelihood at zero. Um, and so you calculate this pseudo R squared from the log likelihoods at, you're starting at zero, and, but, but it's not the same. <coughs> it's a statistic that's really worthless. I mean, you don't need to, essentially it gets higher as your likelihood gets higher. So what? You know. Okay, probe it. Um, recall that there are three basic problems or limitations with logit. Um, first, uh, it does not allow for random taste variation. Secondly, it doesn't allow for correlation over time and unobserved factors. And third, it does not um, allow for unrestricted substitution patterns. It places very severe restrictions on the substitution patterns. Logit is beautiful except for those three limitations, and those are pretty severe limitations. Probit solves all three of those. Um, and in that regard, probit is, in a sense, the, uh, well, it's a very, very general discrete choice model. You can do a tremendous amount with it. The one restriction that still exists in probit is that it, as we will see, assumes normal distributions for all error terms. Um, in many cases, you will not think that your error terms actually have a normal distribution in which case probit might not be the best thing that you could possibly think of for, for your situation. For example, a price coefficient. You might think that um, the people's response to price is randomly distributed in the population in, fact, in ways that you can't completely observe as a researcher. And so you might think there's some random coefficient issue about price. But the price coefficient you do know is going to be negative. There's not going to be people out there wanting to spend money. Um, for the same product. And so you would probably not want to put a normal distribution on a price coefficient because that's going to go on both sides of zero and imply that some people uh, like spending money. So in that situation, you probably, you would be concerned. This doesn't mean you wouldn't want to use probit, but you would be concerned about the, the, the issues arising from a normal distribution for that one error term. And you can probably think of other ones where a normal distribution might not be the most appropriate. But this is truly the only restriction that probit has. It deals with everything else uh, quite well. Uh, and the convolution properties of normals makes it operate extremely well. <coughs> There is one other slight drawback, not from the model itself, but just pedagogically. It's extremely complicated. As you'll see, the, the way you go about simulating it is, is, is very difficult. It's very difficult to understand what's actually going on. And when you have problems, it's hard to decipher where they're coming from. Okay. Um, that's not meaning the model's limited. It just means our ability to interact with the model. Is, is somewhat difficult. And so, uh, you know, you might want another model just to have greater simplicity. But in any case, um, let's go in. What I want to do today is describe what the probit model is, how it solves those three problems with Logit, and then how do we actually simulate it. As you'll see, there is no closed form, and so we want to simulate it. Um, I'm going to discuss the three, three types of simulators today, including GHK. On your syllabus, I said we we're going to talk about GHK next week. I decided to reorganize this, get all the simulation procedures done today, and the next lecture talk about technical issues that arise when you're trying to program the thing. <laughs>
Okay, so um, we're actually going to talk about GHK today. Okay, I'm going to work slowly because the notation here is important. We start out in our standard situation, utility from alternative I for person in. This is in a one choice situation. Depends on observed factors and unobserved factors. We have a vector of unobserved factors, one for each alternative, J alternatives. Okay, so this is a separate equation for each alternative that gives you a separate error term for each. This is just the collection of all of them. It's a vector. And <clears throat> what we're saying here is for a probit model is that this vector is a distributed normal, zero, and an unrestricted full covariance matrix. In particular, the covariance matrix is not necessarily diagonal. It's got off-diagonal elements are possible, which means that there's correlation in the error terms across alternatives. It also, on the diagonal, can have different elements so that, that there's a possibility of heteroscedasticity. The error variance in the error term for one alternative is not the same as the variance for the other one, not necessarily. So it allows a full, within the concept of a normal distribution, it allows any pattern of heteroscedasticity and correlation that exists. And in fact, you estimate that within your data. Um, just to be complete, I'm going to write the density of this error term as H and write it down because when you're programming it, you actually have to use this density sometimes. This is pi. The determinant of the variance covariance matrix and the exponential. <laughs> That's K by K. Um, I'm sorry, J by J. This is um, when it's transposed one by J, it's J by one, so this becomes one by one. An exponential, that's um, just a scalar when it's finally you take the determinant and that's a scalar. So it all gives you just one number, which is the density. Yeah? Can't quite read the exponent the This is the exponent of negative a half. Oh, negative one half J, the number of alternatives. Okay. So then the choice probability. Do you have another question? Isn't the omega matrix inside of the matrix? Doesn't it have to be to the minus one? The, no, the other one. That ah, is. you're right. Sorry. Thank you. So then the probability of a particular alternative in the most general way written is simply an indicator function of whether utility for that alternative, alternative I, is greater than that for all the other alternatives. Using this density for the error terms, integrated over all errors. So this integration is a j-dimensional integral, as written here at least. Um, and this doesn't simplify. There's no way you can actually perform this integration and get a nice closed form. So what you're doing is you're paying a price for having uh, this full covariant structure for the error terms. The price is you no longer get a closed form. Now there's an alternative way of looking at this that we'll see becomes very useful when you're doing actual simulation and shows that this j-dimensional uh, integral is actually uh, um, a higher dimension that is, abs that is actually needed. Recall from um, the very first lecture that all that matters is differences in utility, that um, 
that you can raise the level of all the utilities combined and it doesn't change behavior. Essentially, uh, the tide comes in and all boats rise. Um, and so all that matters is differences in utility. We can use that to re-express this in a way that becomes important when we do simulation. Um, let's define utility differences with a wiggle over them, tilde. The J-I-N, now we've got an extra subscript, is the utility of alternative J minus the utility of alternative I. So this is J minus I is a way to think of it. The J, these are the ones that are differenced for that person. Um, and you can do that for the V's and the Epsilons also. Under this form of looking at it, the probability that a particular alternative is chosen is the integral of an indicator that, how do I do it here? Actually, I want to do this in two steps just to make it, what's going on here very clear. It's the probability that the utility differences They're all negative. Notice that the i that I'm taking the probability for here, we're interested in the probability of alternative i, is the one that we're subtracting out the utility of it here. Okay? That's important. So when you define utility differences <laughs> against alternative i, then the probability of alternative i can simply be the probability that all of these utility differences are negative. Why? Because ujn is greater than I'm sorry, less than uin if ujn minus uin is negative. So we're just taking that over. So this makes it really nice. All you're looking at is what is the utility difference for all the non-chosen alternatives? And that has to be negative for the chosen alternative to end up being chosen. You can then write this, of course, as an indicator that V J I N plus Epsilon J I N, where both of these are differenced against alternative I, is less than zero, H Epsilon J I, these are um, error differences, D Epsilon J I. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, the notation here is this is a vector of all the, the utility differences differenced against I, so it's I n, and this is I n, okay? Here we have a J minus one integral, dimensional integral, because we've essentially subtracted out one of the utilities, and everything now is in utility differences or error differences, or representative utility differences. Everything is differenced against that first alternative. So there's only j minus one of these. All of the j ones minus the one that we subtracted out. This is a vector j minus one in length. And um, so when we look at it that way, what we're saying is we've got a j minus one integral with the, with the indicator being, are all these utility differences negative? It's a much more succinct way to look at it. Isn't the previous one on the bottom left already a j minus one and, uh, dimension integral as well? Before you the Here. Below the Here. No, this is a j. These are your j errors. You got one error for each alternative. You then subtract out the ith one. You now have j minus one of them because the ith one becomes itself minus itself, which is zero. It's no longer an error term. So this has j elements, this is j minus one elements. So when you take error differences, you don't change the model, you reduce the dimension of integration, which saves you when you're doing calculations, and you can think of this in a very succinct way that this, all, the, all the utility differences have to be negative for the person to choose alternative i. Uh, I'm a little confused by the notation you're using with the big j i n. Okay. To all the J's, not just one specific one. In the integral, 
Yes. We have the indicator V J N plus epsilon J I N less than zero. And this like you're only talking about one, you're actually talking about all of them seven things. Right. <laughs> That good. Yeah. Um, Can I ask one thing? Yes. I understand what you did with the differences, but if you look at the previous integral, uh, I was just subtracting the i from from from, and I get exactly the same thing that's in the brackets. But I was taking the difference just to see what what L, what changed. In the, in the density and in the integration, and it looked the same, or when you change the density, because you're not using all the errors. Aha, uh -huh. yes. Um, and that's what I was going to get to next. Yes, good. So now what these new error differences are, this is j minus 1 vector of error differences. This is now distributed normal 0 omega sub i. Notice that these are linear combinations of the old errors. And so, because they're normal, uh, the sum of normals is normal. So you, end, you know it's going to be normal. Each of them have zero mean to start with. So when you take differences, they're going to have zero mean. The only difference is now they've got a different covariance matrix. Now this is the covariance matrix for the error differences instead of the covariance matrix for the original errors. However, there is a relationship between the two. And this is what we're going to do next lecture is describe this within the context of other things like this, of how do you derive this covariance matrix from that one? Okay. But for now, all you need to realize is that if you know there's a covariance matrix for the errors, then there's some way you're going to be able to derive the covariance matrix for the error differences. And this is the covariance matrix for the error differences when they're differenced against alternative i. One thing you might think about that's interesting here is that even if this is diagonal, such that they're uncorrelated errors, this will not be diagonal because all of them have the common influence of epsilon i. They all have that one same thing subtracted from them all. So these are going to be have uh, off diagonal elements even if this has diagonal uh, has zeros off diagonal. In any case, when you think about it this way, it's much more succinct. You realize that all you're really talking about is differences in utility. That's important to always remember. You talk about each non-chosen utility difference is negative for the event to occur, and you've got a j minus 1 integral, dimensional integral. OK, so now how does this solve the three problems that we had with Logit? First of all, um, we've got, in Logit, we had uncorrelated errors. And that's what essentially gave rise to the um, uh, independence from irrelevant alternatives property. Uh, the the um, proportional substitution patterns, in that essentially each alternative in unobserved factors was unrelated to all the other alternatives. So when you improved one, there was no basis for thinking it should draw more from one alternative than another, because for unobserved factors, they were all independent of each other. So it was that independence of errors that gave us, gave us those, those um, restrictive substitution patterns. Here we're allowing any pattern of error correlation. Um, and as a result, you can get any pattern of substitution. Now, if you want to go through this, it's not illuminating, but you can do the same thing we did with Logit and compare the ratio of two probabilities, i and k, stick in this formula for i and k, and you'll realize that that ratio depends on all the data for all the alternatives. So it does not reduce, as in Logit, to where this ratio depends only on the data for i and k. It depends on data for all the alternatives, which means that substitution patterns, which affect this ratio, or are determined by this ratio, um, will depend on all the data and all the parameters. So essentially, you're estimating the substitution pat um, patterns by estimating these, these omega, the omega matrix. So that's the first thing. It allows for correlated errors. Random taste variation, it also can handle extremely simply. I'm going to just give a simple example because the notation uh, gets hairy when you do it in general and there's no greater insight. So let's talk about two alternatives, one and two. 
And let's suppose that they both depend on one explanatory variable, say the time it takes to travel, or whatever, by car and bus, whatever you want to think about, times a coefficient that actually varies over people. So in, unlike a logit model, it's going to assume we're going to have it varying over people. And an error that I'm now putting is e, not epsilon, for reasons you'll see later. So this is your original model. We know that these are have some mean in the population, and or let's describe it better as just to show the <coughs> that has a mean and a variance in the population. Okay. Um, these are now the parameters of the model that we want to estimate. We're not interested in the parameter for each individual person, or we don't think we can estimate it, actually, because we don't have but one data point for each person. But we are interested in the mean and the standard deviation in the population. Standard logit model, this is set to zero. Now we're allowing there to be variance in this. If we then just plug that in, we get the mean plus standard deviation times a normal deviate, and I always put as normal uh, for normal deviates, eta. I'm sorry. This now becomes our error term for the first alternative. And this is our error term for the second alternative. Eta standard normal. Eta standard normal. So it's a standard normal. I'm multiplying it by the standard deviation so that it has the necessary variance. And this is now a parameter of the model to be estimated along with that one. But that parameter enters through the error term. What is going to be the um, covariance matrix for this? What's going to be our omega? Well, we can work that out. The variance of epsilon 1 in is equal to sigma squared x1 in squared plus, um, let's say this is normal also, <coughs> 1. Okay? And that's also true for number 2. So we get on the diagonal elements. And then the covariance it's the pro expectation of the product of these. If these are independent, that drops out. These are not independent. That's the same eta entering both of those for its tastes. Its tastes are common. Uh, the same tastes are used to evaluate each of these alternatives. So that creates this correlation here. So that's sigma squared x1, x2. So we get a covariance matrix that looks like this. Or we could write it as the identity matrix plus sigma squared times x1 n squared, x2 n squared x1 in, x2 in. Okay. So, and then what we're going to do when we um, uh, we just plug that into here, when we um, evaluate our probabilities, and our goal is to not just estimate b, but this sigma squared. So it allows us to, uh, to estimate random taste variation. You can generalize this, of course, to where this is a vector, this is a vector, and then the notation just becomes matrices instead, and it just gets more complicated, but it's the same idea. So we can handle random taste variation. We can, of course, handle systematic taste variation in the same way you did in Logit, by just interacting um, explanatory variables with each other. So there's no problem there. Correlation over time can also be handled by this model. Um, can I erase this? No? Um, 
I want to keep this part. So let me put a mark around it because we're going to come up with it later. And I can erase this. Um, also, if y'all would tell me when things aren't coming across, um, I spent uh, probably four years in my life not using logit probit models because I just couldn't understand them. Um, and I think I have digested this to a way that makes it understandable. Um, and I really want that to come across. So if it doesn't come across, let me know and we'll try to do something about it. This particularly comes true when we get into the GHK simulator. Um, Okay, correlation over time, it also allows that. Let's now look at a, time, a series of choices over time. So we have utility from alternative I, four person in, in time period T. They face repeated choices in each time period. Okay. Now let's define our error term for this person, our vector, as being the errors over all alternatives over all time. So we start out with the error for the first alternative in the first time period, go up to the error for the jth alternative in the first time period, then start with this second time period and do the same thing and continue on that until you get to the last time period. capital T, J, N, T. So this is now J times T by 1. Okay, so it's a vector that has uh, J times T elements. If you've got five choices in 10 time periods, you've got 50 errors, and this is just a vector that carries all 50 of those errors over time. Well, using this same concept, we know that in every time period, the utility differences for the non-chosen alternatives have to be negative. Okay? And that's true in every single time period. So we can define define a sequence of alternatives chosen in each of the alternatives, I mean each of the time periods. Okay. So this is a sequence that defines which alternatives chosen in each of the time periods. Then we can simply calculate the probability for this alternative, I'm, I'm sorry, for this sequence, is equal to the probability that the Utility difference against the alternative that was chosen for that time period, okay, um, let's call this sub t, keep the notation nice, in t. Okay, let me write this all down and then. Here we're taking the jth alternative in time period t and subtracting out. Do you need to stop? It's probably a good time to stop. So this is v, um, the utility of alternative j in time period t minus the utility for alternative i sub t, that is the one that was chosen in that, that time period in time period t. So it's um, utility alternative j minus alternative i sub t for person in in period t. So this little t here is subscripting the i to tell you which alternative was chosen in that period. In any case, all you're getting is differences in observed utility, 
differences and errors, those things have to be negative for all the non-chosen alternatives in all the periods. There's really no difference from what we had here. It's just we're expanding it to be for lots of time periods, which is simply the integral of, hang on just a second, of that times h of the error differences, this um, taking these errors, the error difference, okay, and now where the error differences are um, j minus 1 times t length, and they're normal, 0, a way to describe this is um, I star. Okay. So you start out with errors that are J times T. They have a covariance matrix, which is J times T by J times T. So it's maybe 50 by 50. And you end up with one that is, um, if it's uh, five alternatives, this becomes four times 10, which is 40. But in any case, it's no different from what you were doing before. It's just you do it repeatedly for every time period, and the matrix just gets enormous. This allows you to have any correlation over time or all over alternatives. You can have the first alternative in the first period correlated with the fifth alternative in the 15th time period. There's an element there for that. And you can test whether that's zero. Oh, actually, you had a question? Yeah. Why don't you have a subscript T on J? Should, isn't J also a, a vector with, depending the probability, with the V tilde up? Lower, uh, lower. Here. It's here, the yeah. I chosen now. Why? It's the I chosen. It's a different what? set of J's. This is, oh, you mean a different set of J's in each choice situation? I see what you're saying. The notation here, it, conceptually, it's easy to think of what's going on. To write it in a neat way is difficult. I think you might be right. The more correct way would be to put J sub T because the first alternative in the first period might be chosen and hence not a J, whereas in the second period it wouldn't be chosen and would be a J. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah. From a programming perspective, it's easy to do this. This is a lot, it's actually true in a lot of this stuff. The programming is easier than writing it in math terms. Writing all this in programming language is much more succinct and intuitive. It's interesting how our math notation is not written for these purposes. And this is one reason I think the models are more complicated than they need to be. Yeah? Uh, so, to, to the probability of choosing, I'm trying to figure what's the, the probability, of, probability of choosing the alternative. Why do you have to have higher of utility in every time period. This is the probability that the person made the sequence of choices that is defined by this sequence. Oh, right. So they made a particular choice like one day, one, one week, one day they took car, the next day they took bus, the third day they took rail, the first, the third day they took rail, whatever sequence of choices they made, this is the probability for that observed sequence. <coughs> and all it means is that in every time period, the utility difference for the non-chosen alternatives is negative. There's nothing new. And now we've got a matrix that's enormous. It's the number of alternatives times time periods in, 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 in um, size. So you, it allows full correlation between any alternative in any time period with any other alternative in any other time period. All I'm showing here is that this is extremely general. And there's nothing new going on here. It's essentially just what we had before. So it can handle any type of correlation. Now, generally, you won't want to estimate a full omega matrix for this time period. You might want to impose some kind of AR1 structure on it, which reduces the number of parameters to one, instead of uh, one for each alternative, at least, rather than all uh, 50 by 50 of them. Anything else? Yeah. The notation on the omega in the normal distribution in I star. Essentially, it's the differences, the utility, the correlation in these utility differences defined against the chosen alternative in each period. Yeah? The V that we estimate this model, is it very new to it? I mean, it's the average of the data, maybe not to the right board more. You say, you say the beta is distributed normal, zero, or something, something. Right. I mean, 
This is, the B here is like your average price response in the population. This is the variance in your price response. And for many policies, all you'd care about is what the average is. You're putting your product out, and maybe all you care about is how the average person's going to react to it. But a lot of times, you're putting a product out that's only going to work for people that have a very low price response. You know, it's a high-priced product. Some people will like it, but only those with a low price response. And so you're interested in what share is out there. Isn't it nonlinear, the response is nonlinear, so you can just yeah. multiply the Yes, correct. And I use those terms loosely in what I just described. But this is going to capture the average person's response uh, after you go through the nonlinearity. This is the distribution in that. OK, so now the question is, we've got this model that's just wonderfully general. Uh, it can do practically everything we want. The only limitation is that it's based on normal distributions, which might not be appropriate in some situations. But aside from that, it does everything you want. Unfortunately, it's not reducible in any way that makes life simple. Uh, this integral just sits there like it is. Uh, what do we do? So let's have a six minute break till five minutes after, and then I'll describe the various simulation methods that can be used to estimate this. There have actually been probably 30 or 40 different simulators uh, uh, suggested for probit models. And there's been a lot of discussions on which one's best. These are the three that I think are most important to explain. The first two, because you'll see that they come up in other contexts. You actually will not end up using accept, reject, or accept, reject, and smoothing for probit models. But they have very important pedagogic purposes, and they'll come up in other contexts. And when you're writing your own things, you might want to start using these for other purposes. The third one, GHK, is the one that's actually used. It turns out to be quite uh, accurate, uh, more accurate, it seems, than other simulators. So the first two are very important pedagogically and in other models. And this is the place they arose. And then the GHK is what is actually Im implemented. Yeah? So we're asking what the initial stands for? Um, I'll get to that when we talk about GHK. OK, accept, reject. Um, essentially, what you're doing here is you know that the probability takes this form. The procedure is to draw error differences from a normal distribution with the correct covariance, add them to the differences in representative utility, and um, determine whether your answers are negative. If the answers are all negative, then those errors would lead the person to choose what they actually chose, alternative I. What okay? happens with ties? Hmm? Like what happens with ties don't happen empirically. They're interesting mathematically, but they don't ever occur in your computer. So you can ignore them. Um, mathematically, you have to deal with, oh, probability zeros, what happened when these things converge. But it's just a lot of gobbledygook. It really doesn't matter. Um, let's actually, I can, I can do this. We don't even need to think of utility differences. So let me do this in terms of not utility differences for, um, for accept, reject. So the probability of alternative i is equal to the integral over the int um, uh, indicator that v um, I okay. So the procedure is draw epsilon in from the normal distribution. Okay, so you take a draw of the error terms. Um, oh, this is for given values of the omega. So you, you, you have given values. And in each iteration of your estimation process, you will have whatever your values are at that point. You start with something. It doesn't matter what. Um, I mean, it does matter, but that's not relevant for this simulation. Whatever 
you have as your omega matrix at this iteration, that's what you take draws from. But mm. then how do we think about the correlation between this period epsilon and the next period epsilon? This is a one period thing. You can generalize it as we did before. So just think about this as one period. Um, the simulator for multi-periods is just notationally more difficult. You draw instead of the error for each alternative, you draw it for each alternative for each time period. And you do the same thing. So that's just a simple generalization. So you draw the error terms, you calculate the utility for each alternative, this is for all alternatives, you um, observe whether the utility for your chosen alternative I is greater than all the other ones. Okay. If so, call this an accept. If not, call it a reject. It's important to know what we're accepting, why we're accepting and rejecting here. We're drawing an error. And then we're essentially asking the question, could, would that error lead to alternative I being chosen? And so we calculate the utility of each alternative with that error. And if indeed alternative I has the highest utility with that, calculate, with that error term that we drew, then that error term leads to, that, that error, that, that value of the error leads to this alternative I being chosen. And so we accept that error term. We say, okay, that's an error term that's consistent with the person's behavior. That's an error term that is consistent with alternative I being chosen. If it doesn't lead to alternative I being chosen, we reject it and say that error term is one that would not lead to this person doing what they did. Another way to think about it is, since we know what this person did, they chose alternative I, we know their error term must be one of the accepts. Because only the accepts lead to that behavior. It couldn't be one of the rejects. So this is what we mean by accept and reject. We accept it as being consistent with the behavior that we observed, or we reject it as not being consistent with the behavior we observed. And then, we calculate the simulated probability as we repeat one to three many times, okay, and average and, and calculate number of accepts divided by number of draws. Okay. So suppose we took a hundred draws. And in 12 of them, that draw of the error term led to the behavior that the person actually exhibited. Then we'd say the probability of that behavior is then 12 over 100, 12%. So this is the simulated probability of the um, alternative. Yeah. Do you when you do one again, do you modify the sigma, the variance covariance matrix? No. Um, this is very important. Um, remember when you're doing maximum likelihood, you start out with starting values, starting B and omega, okay? And then for those starting values, you calculate the log likelihood, calculate the gradient, which is based on the log likelihood, take a step and go to next, the next one, okay? So then you go to iteration two with a new beta. What I'm talking about is that each of these steps, when you've got a given beta and a given omega matrix, you have to calculate the probability to calculate the log likelihood. This is how you do it. You take lots of draws from the distribution for that omega, whatever your omega is in that step of your iteration process, each draw, you calculate the utility for each alternative. 
if the chosen alternative has the highest utility, then you accept that draw, otherwise you reject it, and then you count up how many accepts you got out of the whole share. And this is your simulated probability. You then put that into your likelihood function, take the derivative of it, the gradient and everything, and then go to step two, get your new omega, and repeat the whole process. So this is how do you calculate the probability given the parameters, which becomes a step in finding the parameters in the iterative process. Now we had several questions here. What was yours? Um, I think it's irrelevant, but I was just wondering, You once you pick your error terms, you calculate PIN for all the i's, right? Because every time you change the error, PI is going to change. You calculate epsilon. Like you calculate the shares, the probabilities for every alternative. No. If you're doing it for maximum likelihood, you might, in some situations, if you're forecasting. But for maximum likelihood, you just need to calculate it for the chosen alternative. Because all you want is the probability of the chosen alternative in the log likelihood function. This is not aggregated. Hmm? So thinking in terms of aggregated. Over people? Yeah. Over yeah. Oh, yeah, if you're wanting to forecast, then yes, you'd do it. And there, what you'd do is you would essentially take your draws, put them in bins. This draw gives this outcome, this draw gives that outcome, and the share would be the accepts in each bin divided by total. Uh, yeah? Uh, I just want to make sure here, I is actually choosing alternative. I'm sorry? I is actually choosing alternative. This is, I'm talking about it now as if I is the alternative that the person actually was observed to choose because that makes it easy to discuss. It's are these errors consistent with what the person actually did. But you can do it for any, you don't have to th think about it that way. This is the probability of alternative I. And we're asking the question, which of these errors would give alternative I being chosen? And uh, the way I was describing it was that it's the, if you're going to use this for maximum likelihood, it's the I that was actually chosen. But if you want to do it for other purposes, you can do it for all the I's or another I or whichever. The point is, you're trying to get the errors. What portion of the error draws give you alternative I being chosen? And we know it's only chosen if the utility for it is higher than the others. So we observe this part. We're now randomly choosing these things, adding it on, and seeing how often the utility for the alternative I is highest. And that's either for the chosen alternative or any alternative you're interested in. Notice that the way I've described this, you're taking the number of steps over number of draws, doesn't really relate too closely to this thing here, at least as I described it. However, it does. Essentially, we're taking the average of this indicator function over the distribution of the error terms. We're simulating this by taking draws from the distribution, determining whether this statement in here is true or not. If it is true, we give it a 1. If it's not, we give it a 0. And take the average of those zeros and 1s. The 1s are the accepts, so it's the number, the numerator in that average is the total number of accepts. The denominator is the number of draws altogether, accepts or rejects. So what we're essentially doing is what I said all simulation does, which is to approximate an integral over a density by drawing from the density and calculating the integral for draws from that density. So a way to think about this is we're simulating this as 1 over r, where r is the number of draws, little r is um, for um, a particular draw. <clears throat> the indicator of VIN plus epsilon IN for draw R is greater than VJN plus epsilon JN draw R. So to put this back in the way I was describing in the first lecture, we're simulating this integral with a sum of draws from this distribution and evaluating this function for every draw from that distribution and averaging the results. It ends up the same. This is a great concept for simulating, mainly because it is so straightforward. <laughs>
Essentially, what you're doing in your simulation process is what you believe the world is doing that you're trying to model. You've observed certain things. You don't observe certain things. They're distributed in the world in this fashion. And so essentially, you're just sampling from the world and seeing when will a certain type of behavior come about. Um, this is no different. What this means is that simulation is on exactly the same footing as sampling people. You've got a universe of people out there. You sample some of them, and you know it's from a population, and you take that into account when you're doing things. Here, we're, in a sense, sampling further on the basis of unobserved factors, as well as observed factors, from the distribution of those things out in the population. And when we know both the observed and the unobserved things, we can perfectly predict behavior, and we just calculate how often that certain behavior is going to occur. This can be applied to any model that you can write. This is why it's useful. You can always resort to accept-reject simulation. So if you were looking at sort of substitutability among choices, do you then re-simulate by, say, changing a value in your V and see how the probability changes? Yeah. After you've got, you use this to get estimates of omega and B, mm -hmm. or whatever enters here, and then change whatever you want to. Notice this, this omega can depend on data too, in the very varying parameters case that we were talking about earlier. This omega depends on parameters and data, so the data might enter here as well. Changes in the data might. Okay, so this is great because it's conceptually straightforward. It really points out what you're trying to do with simulation and how it's conceptually no different from what we've done in econometrics all your life, which is deal with samples from populations and what that behavior for those sampled individuals tell you about the population. Um, the disadvantages are severe. First of all, um, <laughs> first of all, you're not guaranteed to get a non-zero probability. It's possible that you could take R draws and have them all be rejects. And so you get a probability of zero. Okay. Probability of zero is not an impossible number, but it does wreak havoc with maximum likelihood procedures because you have to take the log of the probability and the log of zero is not defined. So if you are running through your code and ever end up with getting zero probability for one person, all it takes is one person in one iteration and your code blows up. So you can't, you can't use zeros and you can't guarantee not getting zeros. Um, there are two ways to deal with this. One is to just continue drawing until you get at least one accept, but then your statistics get muddled up because the number of draws is no longer an exogenous factor. It's endogenous and depends on your parameters. So you've got a real headache from an econometric point of view. It's good not to do that. The other approach is just to take so many that you're bound to get some accepts. Well, that might be humongous. Um, for example, suppose you're looking at a situation where you've got 10 alternatives in 20 time periods. This is not so unusual. It's um, where you live over 20 years of your life, parts of the country. It's not a strange choice situation at all. Anyway, this I worked out and is um, you've got a trillion, what did I get? A billion trillion alternatives or sequences that are possible. And so any one if they're all equally likely, just to give you a sense, then any one of them, you would get an accept only if you took a billion trillion draws. You'd expect to get one accept. Okay, well, you might not. You might have to take twice that many. Two billion trillion. Your computer just can't do it. Okay, so especially in time series situations where you've got lots of alternatives because of the dimension of time, um, finding an accepted uh, sequence can be difficult. So this is, this is a difficulty. If you're dealing with situations where the number of alternatives is small and the probability for everyone's relatively large, you know, like 5% or something, then you don't need to worry about that too much. The second problem is that this is not a continuous simulator. What essentially it looks like is 
If you change either the beta or the, the parameters or the x's, whichever one, it's not, it's not continuous in either the data or the um, parameters. If you look at the simulated probability, what happens is for changes that don't, you could change parameters and yet utility for alternative i is still the highest. So if it was except before, you change the parameter, it's still an except. Or, or if it was a reject before, you change the parameters an infinitesimally small amount, it's still, um, it could be that alternative i is higher than alternative j, and you change the parameters, it moves them a little closer together, a little further together apart, but they're still rank ordered the same. So it doesn't change any except from a reject or a reject from, to an except. So what you get is this function being flat for ranges of parameters and data for which the simulated probability doesn't change. That is, where, for ranges in which an accept doesn't turn to a reject or vice versa. And then you get a step function. Here, a reject becomes an accept, and it goes up, and then it's flat again. Here, another accept, uh, reject becomes an accept, or it could go vice versa, go down. So what you get is a step function. And this is, say, maybe 1 over r, only one of them is accepted, and then you make the parameter higher, eventually two are accepted. So you get these discrete jumps in your simulated probability. This makes use of this procedure in maximum likelihood, where you use gradients um, to find the maximum, extremely difficult. Essentially, the gradient is either zero or undefined. So you can't use gradient-based procedures. Now, what you can do is take approximate gradients, kind of arc gradients. You could say, okay, well, I'm at this point here, and I want to know what the slope of this is. Well, I know the slope's zero in reality right there, but that's just because, you know, I'm not getting any except to rejects. Let me take a discrete change and calculate the slope as that, okay? So I could say, okay, well, let me just move, I take, instead of an infinitesimally small change, take a large change, a discrete change, get the change in the, um, the simulated probability, divide it by whatever size of this change is, and take that as a slope. The problem with that is it's extremely arbitrary. You'll get a different answer depending on how big of a step you're taking. You take a step here, you'll get a smaller slope. You just take a smaller step that passes this jump, and of course you don't know where this jump is, but if you pass it, you'll get a higher slope. So you'll get zero, then very high, then lower and lower, and so you get any, any gradient you want, depending on how you program up your thing. So it turns out that these are extremely ineffective in, in gradient-based procedures. Yeah? So from, I don't know whether it's from my direction of how I'm looking at this. So the height of each step is the same, one over r. However, the length of the step, it, it can, can be anything, right? Right. Okay, because from here it looks like they're all equal. No, it just depends on how long it takes this yes. until uh, the reject becomes an accept, right? Now, I describe this in very grim terms. It's actually not as horrible as I just described it, though it, it is uh, hard to deal with. Because what you're doing here is, um, the likelihood function is the average of this over all people in your sample. So if each person has this one, this kind of step thing, then the next person's gonna have steps at different places, and you do get something that's kind of, it's still a step function, but it's, it's pretty smoothed out, somewhat smoothed out, okay? So it's not quite as bad. But still, if you put these into numerical procedures, it, 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 it will, it's very difficult. You often just keep bouncing around and never reach a maximum, okay? Um, so that's the difficulty of them. As a result, these are hardly ever used in gradient-based procedures. However, they are getting revived in these procedures we'll talk about later, where we don't actually maximize the likelihood function, because uh, there, these difficulties don't matter. Uh, so again, these are very important conceptually. Okay, well given that this is the problem, a direct way to solve it, did you have a question? Okay. Um, a relatively straightforward way to deal with this is what um, numerical people do all the time, numerical mathematicians, is to smooth it. If you've got a function that is discontinuous, you take a smooth approximation to it, and 
you then have well-defined gradients. And you can do all your gradient procedures. So the second simulator that we're going to discuss is called the smoothed, logit smoothed, accept reject. Um, what that does is instead of using the indicator function 0, 1 for what is the ch what, um, whether it's an accept or a reject, that instead it replaces this with a logit function. Okay, I want to make clear that this logit function has no behavioral implications. It does not mean you're retreating to a logit. It is simply replacing a 0, 1 with an S. It's, a, it's now not a behavioral model. It's simply a smoothing procedure. So in this situation, the simulated probability is going to be 1 over R, sum over all the draws that you're going to take, utility of alternative I for person in under the rth draw of the error term. So we're taking, actually let me just write it out explicitly. V i n plus epsilon i n draw r. So it's the rth draw of the error term. Add that to the observed part of utility. Divide that by the sum of all things, all the other alternatives. Okay. What this does is replace the step function for any one element here. Instead of having that 0, 1 step function, which is zero until you accept and then it becomes one, right? So if you're changing data or parameters or whatever, for any one draw, you either get a zero, one, accept or reject. So it's reject until it becomes accept and so it's a step function like this. <coughs> what this is doing is replacing this with an S shape that smooths it out. Now, as soon as you see this as a smoothing mechanism, you realize, using numerical standard smoothing processes, that there are degrees to which you can smooth. And so actually, what you want to do to make this tr within the concept of a smoothing function is to divide the whole thing by some scalar, lambda, okay, which determines the degree of smoothing. As lambda approaches zero, the logit function approaches a zero, one indicator. Essentially, as you start out with a, let's say, high lambda, okay, or whatever yours, you get a, um, if you lower lambda towards zero, that raises the scale of everything in the model and pushes it, the, the logit model, closer to zero, one. Okay, so this is lower. And eventually, you can get it with a high enough lambda to where it just barely scoots like that. With low enough lambda, as this approaches zero, you get it kinking in closer and closer, and all essentially that you're doing is shaving off these two kink points. And it's continuous. This is not an upward jump. It's just a very slightly to the left movement, but it's, it's practically an upward jump. So the idea is you can always set lambda close enough to get it being arbitrarily close to a zero, one. Now, within the tradition of numerical smoothing, the idea is you would raise lambda the larger your sample size. Because notice, remember that sample size will smooth this for you some, because you get the different jumps for each person added on to each other, and it smooths a little bit. So you need um, less smoothing for each person. Right? Notice that as lambda gets lower, 
there's less smoothing for each person. Okay? You move from this, which is real nice and smooth, to something that's less smooth. Okay? So the idea is, from a numerical perspective, you want to lower lambda. I hope I said that correctly before. Lower lambda. I said it wrong. You want to lower lambda, get closer and closer to the 0, 1 for each person as you get more people in your sample. So as n rises, lower lambda. OK, well, theoretically, all this makes sense, and it's all within traditions that you've probably seen before on smoothing mechanisms. The problem is, when you've got a particular n sample size, how do you know what lambda to choose? And there's no guidance on that. Essentially, you do whatever you want. Um, hmm? Well, a logit does have a scale to it. Um, hmm? Why not put it at 1? You could. But one is not, there's no magic, there's no relation to this to a logit model in a behavioral sense. Lambda of one has no greater meaning than lambda of a half or a quarter of five or anything else. So that is a choice. You can choose that, but it's arbitrary. I'm trying to see what the game is. Oh, if you put lambda at a half, then the problem with having this smooth thing is you're getting gradients that are a result of your smoothing rather than the underlying behavioral model. So you want to have smoothness, but you want to have as little of that effect of the smoothness on your gradients. And so you want lambda to be as low as possible, and yet still have nice numerical properties. Essentially, you experiment. You just try different things. So yeah. Isn't it possible to get a closed form expression for lambda if we try to minimize some criteria, criterion like mean square error? Yes. Um, well, you don't want to, I mean, mean square error against the zero, 1 will give you a lambda that's, you know, infinitely small. I mean, it just gets smaller and smaller. You have to have something trade off, and what trades that off is the difficulty of the numerical procedures, which, again, is just a matter of how, how it's estimating on each time. Um, I'm getting into this mode of uh, getting pushy. I don't want to do that. Uh, anyway, this is, this is a really nice conceptual procedure that has the inherent difficulty that's not going to be solved of what to set lambda to. You as a researcher have your choices. You can try several and show that it doesn't make a difference. Your results turn out the same anyway. And that's, that's satisfying. Yeah. Well, I have the same question. What's the trade-off on the other side? Why don't, why don't you just pick the smallest lambda that your computer can handle? Well, if you do that, you're back to zero, 1, and your numerical procedure is going to do very badly. If it's actually as low as your machine can handle, then it is, from its perspective, a zero, 1. Or like just a step above. Just a step above. Well, how about half that step? It's just computing time. It takes more computing time. Um, no, that the numerical procedure won't find the maximum easily during this because it's calculating gradients that aren't relevant to finding the maximum. That's the basic problem. The basic problem here is, one, I, what I put here was that the concept of what is a gradient here is arbitrary. It's either zero or any of these values. But what the bigger, what that is really meaning is that we don't know what gradient to use to get to the maximum. Okay. And so we try to smooth this out in a way that allows the gradient at any point to point us in the direction of the maximum. But if we don't do enough smoothing, we're back to our original problem. If we do too much smoothing, we're creating a new function that doesn't have the same maximum as the old one. Okay, so the problem here was remaining that you still have this arbitrariness of lambda. What do you do? You're kind of adding another model or another shape on top of your true model, and you'd like not to do that. What this gave rise to then, or after years and years of alternative suggestions on this, finally a procedure called GHK was developed. Um, the GHK is for John Gevicki. Um, Bacillus Hajavisiliu, 
and Michael Keane. Um, these two people independently came up with the recursive procedure that we're going to be using, and Vasilis came up with the smoothing aspect of it, which is an inherent smoothing. It's from the behavioral model itself, not from an added on thing. So all three of these were uh, uh, instrumental in it, and it's called uh, GHK as a result of them. Okay. Here we n use error differences. The simulator is based on using error differences, and this is an essential and complicating aspect of the simulator. But nevertheless, you have to talk in terms of error differences. So, let's go in and do that. You have your original model. I'm just going to repeat this somewhat, but I want it all again here. Okay. With your errors. And your errors distributed normal omega. Okay. Now we can define error uh, differences. Um, do the same for the representative part of utility and the unobserved part of utility. Okay. So this is the difference between alternative J and I for person N. Then the probability for alternative I is the probability that all these error differences are negative. Okay. The error differences now can be accumulated into a vector, can be pulled together into a vector, which is the difference between the first alternative and alternative i <coughs> on up to the jth alternative and alternative i, where now the dots omit alternative i. So this is all of them except alternative i. This is j minus 1 in length. Okay. And it's distributed normal 0 omega i, where this omega is derived from that one, again, in a way that we'll see next week. OK. now. This is a repeat of what I've already said. Now let's get into how the, um, the, the way of looking at this that gives rise to the GHK estimator. How do we take draws from this? Suppose we were wanting to take draws from this estimator. Uh, I'm from, sorry, from this distribution. This is a multivariate normal. And we don't have random normal generators, random gener number generators for multivariate normals. We've only got them for um, independent normals independent standardized normals. So the way we do it is to use that Chodolesky transformation that I described the very first lecture. Let CI be the Cholesky factor of omega i. That is CI, CI transpose is equal to omega. This is like the generalized standard deviation Okay. This is lower triangular. It's got zeros above the diagonal and things on the diagonal and below. Um, and in our case, you can think of it as C 
one one zero on up C I want to be sure I'm doing this right two one C two two on up zeros C three one C three two C three three zeros and continuing okay. So we label it C11 as the top left element, and the next row has C21, C22, next one, et cetera, and we just continue down for all J rows. In this case, we can now write all these utility differences in very succinct fashion. Um, take a draw. I'm sorry. Take J minus 1 IID standard normals. Labeled Ada 1 to Ada J. Okay, with the, this leaving out the I. It doesn't matter. You could do J minus 1. It really doesn't matter. Let's do it J minus 1. Okay. Then, the utility for alternative 1, utility difference for alternative 1 from I, is going to be V1 IN plus C11 times the first error deviation. 2 I in is going to be plus this. I'm sorry. C 2 1 epsilon 1 plus C 2 2 eta 2. Okay. And the third one, just to be complete. And then you can continue it up on your own. Okay. Or a succinct way to put it would be to stack these, stack the alternatives, and you get the vector of error differences against alternative one, I'm just, the vector of utility differences against alternative one, is the vector of observed utility differences against alternative one, plus the Cholesky factor times this vector eta, where eta is equal to that. This is a, this is now j by 1. It's the utility stacked. This is j my, times 1, observed utility stacked. This is j minus 1 times j minus 1. And this is j minus 1. Okay. So this is the um, Cholesky factor. And all I'm doing here is expanding the Cholesky times Multiplying that times that to get this, that times that to get this, that times that to get this. Okay? So one way to think about this, actually, is probably an easier way. Okay. Essentially, we're creating the errors through this Cholesky transformation. Okay, so now, if we plug this in here, what this is telling us is, you can just write an arrow down on your paper to where we're continuing this. Now we can write this probability in a way that makes it easier for us to simulate. What it is, is that the probability that this 
is less than zero. And this is less than zero. And that's less than zero, etc. The second row, second term should be, yeah. And etc. I'm going to erase this and continue it. So all we've done now is replace this statement with an equivalent statement that uses the Cholesky factor to create the errors that enter here directly from independent errors. Okay. So now all we've done is replace the utilities with the representative utility, the observed part, and the unobserved part that's created from this Cholesky matrix. There's nothing in, uh, unusual there. Now I want to redo this probability. We can look at this probability as a um, series of conditional probabilities. It's the probability that the first event occurs times, instead of having this probability with all this inside the parentheses that all these things occur, we can say, well, what's the probability that this occurs times the probability that the second thing occurs given that the first thing occurs. So this is what makes this a legitimate tr equation because I'm saying, let's say, what's the probability of that? And then conditional on that happening, what's the probability of the second thing occurring? Okay, this is a wiggle. That's the wiggle. Times the probability for the third one. And you just continue like this. Yes. If you rearrange the alternatives, your simulator will give you slightly yeah. different answer. But all of them will be unbiased and um, they converge towards each other. But you're right. The, this recursive process will, yes, I answered it. So the third condition occurring, given that the first two did. So given this occurring and this occurring. Okay, and then continuing that. So now I've just replaced this joint probability with a series of conditional probabilities. Now I'll take one last step. I want to rearrange these so each of them looks like a cumulative distribution. So that each of them will be a cumulative distribution. So I want the error on the left and everything else on the right. So let's take this first one, the probability that eta one is less than minus, take that over there, V one I N wiggle divided by C one one. So that first term is simply the cumulative distribution of this standard normal deviate evaluated at that point. Okay. Times I'm going to just keep them in rows here. The second one then, I'm going to make eta 2 a cumulative conditional uh, um, evaluated at all the other terms. So we want this on the left, everything else on the right. It's eta 2 is less than, take this stuff over there, minus 1.5 
V two I N wiggle plus C two one eta one. Okay, and that's negative that because we're taking this over here and we're dividing by C two two. Given that this occurs. So given that our first error is in the correct range, what's the probability that the second error is in the correct range? And then we do that for the third, and you just continue for all your alternatives. In each case, you're only dividing by the diagonal element, the appropriate diagonal element. So you're only dividing by a constant in each of these, a scalar, which makes life easy. Given that that occurs and that the other condition here applies, okay? so I won't repeat it. Do you want me to repeat it? No, thank you. Continuing. So essentially what this is saying is what's the probability that the first error is in the correct range to give us this condition. And then, given that that's happening, what's the probability that the second error is in the correct range for the second thing to occur, and et cetera. Now, this is the true probability. All we've done is rearrange the pro probabilities to do this. The way this is simulated is as follows. This is simply a the cumulative distribution for epsilon, uh, for eta one. So the first step is calculate, this is a, this is a normal, standard normal dens density, right? So this is the cumulative, standard normal cumulative, evaluated at that. That we can calculate, no problem. Then we take a draw of eta one that's less than this amount. Okay, so we first calculate this probability. Now we're wanting to calculate this probability. So we take a draw in the relevant range for that first alternative, for that first um, error term. How do we do that? We're taking a draw from a truncated normal. We want it to be below this amount. How do we do it? We did this the very first lecture. Remember? You get the cumulative distribution. You figure out um, this point here is going to be the is that right? Ah, huh. here. This point, yes, this point here is going to be the cumulative evaluated at that point. Okay. And so now you want to draw between these two. So you draw, you do this by drawing a standard uniform and calculating a draw of eta that's within this range. By eta one is equal to the inverse normal of mu times the cumulative normal, so mu tells you how far up here to go, then the inverse gives you back down to here. Okay, so this is what we did um, very first lecture. Remember we used the idea there of taking uh, univariate truncated normal, taking draws from it. You um, calculate the uppermost point find out how far in that direction to go, and then take the inverse, that mu gives you a value along here, and then take the inverse of that to get where your, um, your, the value of your um, deviate itself. And then, using this draw, 
calculate this probability. This draw satisfies this condition. Okay? So we use it then to calculate this. So then we calculate the cumulative distribution of negative V2 in plus C21 eta1 using this draw divided by C22. Okay. Continue this for the third, so now we take a draw of epsilon of eta2 from this truncated distribution. Okay. Use the two draws of eta1 and eta2 here and calculate this probability and just continue down. Okay. Then four, repeat. I, I'm sorry. The simulated probability for this draw R is equal to that times this. Continuing, da 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 da. Okay. So all I've got now is I'm replacing this probability with its actual value, I'm replacing this probability with the probability calculated for a draw that meets this condition, okay. then calculate this probability for a draw that meets the conditions, I'm continuing for all of them, and then five, average the PRs over. Rs. So your simulated probability altogether is equal to 1 over R times um, the sum of the simulated probability based on each set of draws. So this is the simulated probability based on that first draw of epsilon of eta 1, eta 2, eta 3. And then you just repeat that, get a different set of draws, get another one, and you take the average of all those. That's a simulated version of this probability. Pretty intense. And in fact, as we'll see next lecture, it sounds more intuitively correct the less you think about it. <laughs> Notice what we're doing here is taking a draw that meets this condition. This probability is the probability that this occurs given one draw, not given all possible draws that meet this condition. How do we know that taking one draw recursively each time then doing that repeatedly gives us the right answer. So not a trivial proof. But it looks like, just intuitively, oh well, we're meeting this condition because we're taking a draw that meets it. Well, the probability, given that the error is in this range, is not the same as the probability for a given draw in the range. Okay? So it looks actually to be easier to prove unbiasedness than actually is. Yep. You're averaging over draws within this range. Right. And that's the averaging process is where you end up having that the average of these probabilities over all the draws here ends up working. Exactly. Okay, sorry I went over again, but next lecture we'll complete this and then go over the program.